Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to introduce Matt Hasselbeck. Thank you very much. I can tell you guys don't think of much of my football career by the questions that you guessed that were not true. All the good stuff, that can't be true. That can't be true. Um, I'm currently playing with the Tennessee Titans, playing a quarterback with the Tennessee Titans, and I did buy meat for my offensive linemen, as was mentioned when I played for the Green Bay Packers. I thought that was uh, fitting. Uh, this last year in Nashville, I bought them uh, Les Paul guitars, because it was Nashville. So you gotta get creative with that. But um, Chris Nowinski, who I'm introducing, is a good friend of mine. We've been friends for um, over 10 years, and there's many great things I could say about Chris, uh, many of which you could read in his bio. He's the, you know, co-founder of uh, the Sp SLI, the Sports Leadership Institute. He's the author of uh, Head Games, which inspired the documentary that you saw the clip of right there. Uh, in 2010, he was uh, a finalist for Sports Illustrated Sportsman of the Year Award, and not for anything he did on the football field or in any athletic uh, endeavor, but just simply for his advocacy on, on behalf of uh, athletes. And we've done a great job in sports of improving awareness and uh, letting athletes know that it's okay to share your symptoms with a coach, a teammate, a doctor, a medical professional. But what we really haven't done, we really haven't used the technology side um, to tackle this problem um, in the way that we should. And uh, Chris has done just a great job of uh, fighting the fight uh, when it comes to head injuries. So uh, it's my great pleasure and uh, honor to uh, introduce a good friend and, uh, and a guy who is uh, uh, doing a great job, Chris Nowinski. Thank you. Well, what an honor to be introduced by Matt Hasselbeck. That's uh, one, of, one of the classiest guys in the league and still one of the best quarterbacks in the league, and I hope uh, still has a, a long career ahead of him. Well, this is a, it, it's an honor to be invited here to talk to you about how technology is going to play a huge role in making athletes safer. Uh, this is something that I've been dedicating my life to for uh, quite a few years now. Uh, as as, as uh, Matt mentioned, with, uh, through Boston University, through Sports Legacy Institute, I'm a consultant to the National Football League Players Association, the Ivy League, and also to MC10, who uh, has a product I'll be talking about here today. But I want to talk to you about why, you know, first, why I care about the concussion and brain trauma issue in sports and why it's so important to me. And that really starts with my career uh, starting at Harvard as a defensive tackle, an all-Ivy defensive tackle. Uh, and then, like most of my uh, Harvard uh, fellow graduates, I joined WWE, uh, World Wrestling Entertainment. Actually, I was the first one. Vince McMahon loved to introduce me as the only Harvard graduate in the history of WWE, which probably should have told me something. But I had a blast. I was Rookie of the Year in 2002. Uh, youngest male hardcore champ in the history of the company. I got to uh, take pictures like this. I like to cover it up now that I'm a professional. It's a little much. But of course, looking at a picture like that helps me realize that you know a lot of us uh, kind of get suckered into taking silly photographs when we're younger. Uh, you might recognize that gentleman from a few minutes ago. But uh, I, got, I was very lucky to get the sound working on this. Uh, very lucky to get to play a fun character uh, in the ring, for those of you who may not remember. Did you get the sound working? All right, well, we'll skip it. You don't get to hear my funny jokes that Chris Harvard used to get to say. But I used to, uh, injuries happen out there, as you can imagine. So I wanted to share with you one of the uh, better injuries from the, this is the Royal Rumble 2003 at the uh, Boston Garden. And uh, what you're about to see happen was a memorable night for me. It caused a little bit of a brain injury for me. And actually, now that we have the sound, I'll share with you what the guy I used to play, just so you know my background. See, the difference between your school and my school is that at Harvard, we have lots of road scholars. At Iowa State, you have lots of dirt roads. Whoa. Got to write my own stuff. And I thought you guys would appreciate that, because I was out there fighting for you. I know there's a lot of big brains in this room, all right? So I was, I was your champion out there. Uh, but it was the summer 2003 where I got a kick to the head from a guy named Bubba Ray Dudley, uh, the handsome man in the middle, uh, that ended my career at the Hartford Civic Center. Got kicked in the head, uh, it was in the middle of the ring, forgot what we were doing, forgot uh, what was next. You know, and most importantly, I, I forgot who was supposed to win the match because wrestling's fake if you weren't certain. Uh, 
And that can be a real disaster out there. We didn't know how to finish it. And so at that time, though, you know, the science wasn't where it was. We certainly had no technology in the concussion space. And so when I went backstage, my athletic trainer said, how you doing? And I said, uh, I'm fine, because that's, as an athlete, what you're taught to say. You're fine. And so uh, I ended up wrestling and working out every day for the next five weeks and only stopped be uh, with a concussion where every time I got my heart rate up, I got nauseous. I was forgetting things. And the only reason I stopped was not because someone smartened me up and diagnosed the concussion. It was because uh, I eventually developed sleepwalking and uh, after, the night after my last match, acted out a dream and ended up jumping through a nightstand. And that's what it took to scare me straight, identify the injury. And that it was the end of my career. Five years of headaches, five years of sleepwalking issues, depression problems, memory issues. And that's what helped me dedicate my life to this. And that started in 2007 after writing the book Head Games. Uh, and that with the Sports Legacy Institute, where our mission is to advance the study, uh, the treatment, and the, really the prevention of the effects of brain trauma in athletes and other groups. And then uh, we, we partnered with Boston University to start the Center for the Study of Traumatic Encephalopathy. Uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy is a disease that we've known as punch drunk for a very long time, but we honestly didn't believe that it existed in other sports, especially the sports that we encourage our children to play in modern times. Uh, the reality is uh, it is a degenerative disease that we are finding in a lot of former athletes, and I'll tell you about that. The sad thing is we were the first center in the world dedicated to this disease, to really, and, and it really opened the world's eyes to what exactly is happening out there uh, in the brains of these athletes. And we started the center in 2008, but we've known that brain trauma was a problem for a very long time. Uh, I just found this quote in a book that was given to me for Christmas, uh, written, uh, this is a quote in 1866 from a very famous lecture. It's been said by one of the greatest masters of the art of surgery that this or any other country has ever produced, talking about the UK, that no injury of the head is too trivial to be despised. And that's something that we really should be appreciating more these days, and, and technology uh, is going to help us do that. Uh, I want to share with you just the context of, of where technology is going to help by introducing you to the disease. This is uh, my, our medical team in the Brain Bank. I'm going to show you some of the work of Dr. Ann McKee, who's one of the world's top neuropathologists, and actually studies the brains now of athletes and military veterans after they pass away. One case I'm going to share with you is a guy named Dave Duerson. Dave was a uh, very famous uh, NFL player, uh, a, a multi-time Super Bowl winner with the Bears and the Giants, four-time Pro Bowler at strong safety. Actually, a guy I met when I was 17 years old, and I won a, uh, a National Football Foundation football scholarship, and he was the presenter to me of my plaque. Uh, after his career in Chicago, he became one of the most respected guys in the business, ran a $70 million a year uh, food distribution business, was recruited multiple times to run for mayor. They, uh, it was actually the Republican Party tried to get him to run for the open Senate seat that President Obama eventually won. But at the age of 45, he started having uh, pretty severe behavioral changes. He had been, since his career ended, he had headaches, he'd had uh, some memory problems that were getting worse and worse. And at about 45, he also started having behavioral problems. He started getting violent with his family. His wife left him, got violent with his children, his children didn't speak to him anymore. By the age of 50, uh, was alone and now $20 million in debt, in personal debt from a number of bad business decisions. He took his life, and this is his actual suicide note that he left, asking us to study his brain, uh, because, as you can assume, I think he knew that the guy he became was not the guy he was, not the guy he should have been. He thought he had this disease, and uh, sadly, he was right. This is Dave Duerson's brain. The, the fast version of explaining this is all of that brown stuff is stuff that's not there, not a normal part of aging. It's a, called a... It's called a, a tau protein that's been hyperphosphorylated, meaning it's, it's, the structures of the brain are starting to fall apart. It's something you find in Alzheimer's disease. And now we're finding it in athlete after athlete. And we actually just put out a study uh, published in Brain that uh, uh, 43 of the first 44 college and professional football players whose brains we studied post-mortem were positive for this disease. Uh, we found it in people younger and younger. So this is Duerson. It affected his frontal lobes. It affected his medial temporal lobes, which controls memory, controls behavior. These are a number of NFL players, uh, some of them well-known, Hall of Famer, with the same pattern of disease. And now, sadly, we're finding it in younger and younger kids. So this is, uh, this is actually the brain of a young man named Owen Thomas, who had just been elected co-captain of the University of Pennsylvania football team uh, in April 2010 when he took his life. Uh, not connecting the disease to the suicide, but just at 21, he'd already had about 20 spots of this disease already spreading. Found it in an 18-year-old, 
uh, and this is just the way it looks like in the beginning, it starts around blood vessels and spreads for some unknown reason. Uh, now we found it in the 17-year-old, and there's no reason we won't continue to find it in younger and younger people. Those brains just luckily are, are harder to acquire. So knowing that this is the consequence of playing sports without worrying about brain trauma, without paying attention to concussions, for many, many people, uh, what we're looked at, looking at now is how do we really change sports to make them safer? How do we change the medical care to make sports safer so that we don't have to worry about uh, our children eventually developing these sorts of problems? A lot of that starts with simply diagnosing concussions. And that's something we do very poorly right now. Uh, and, it, and that's something that, that I experienced myself because when I got that last concussion from Bubba Ray, I thought, honestly, that it was my first concussion. I was 24 years old, a college graduate. I had never been taught what a concussion was. And so when I went to Dr. Robert Cantu's office, who's our, now our medical director and was my doctor at the time, uh, and he said, well, you know, I don't know why you've been having problems for so long with this injury, uh, you know, but how many concussions do you remember? And I said, zero. He said, well, okay, well, I understand you don't think you've had concussions, but how many times have you been hit in the head and you've seen stars? or you got dizzy, or you got confused, or you had double vision. And I said, well, Doc, that happens all the time. But those are dings, and those are bell ringers. And immediately I could recall multiple times in wrestling, multiple times in football, where I'd been dinged. I honestly, that, that video is in the, uh, the, the movie you just saw. I honestly still don't remember what injury that was. I was out there for a while. Uh, I, but uh, I don't honestly remember. So I do know, though, the six guys who got me with my concussions. This is my new enemies list. Good looking group of people. But I now know these things actually happened, but only retrospectively. Um, and the reason why it's so important, just for the quick science lesson, to identify these concussions is because the injury itself is really a chemical and metabolic injury. And so inside of your brain, you, you have a, whole, a, a lot of changes in neurotransmitter function. Uh, things like potassium uh, levels start going crazy, calcium gets inside the cell, it becomes very damaging to the cell, it's toxic. And this stuff lasts for days, and probably weeks, in just about everybody. And so what that means is, and why you've seen all the concussion protocols change in just the last few years, what it means is if, if you identify the concussion, you get them off the field, you don't cause further damage, you allow the brain to recover just like you would a broken bone. But if you leave the athlete out there and they continue to take blows to the head and they continue to exercise and they don't take care of this thing, you're causing cells that would recover to die and you're causing uh, what should be an injury you bounce back from very quickly to be long term or maybe open the door to chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So that's what we need to do. We need to identify these concussions when they happen. The problem is right now we don't and for those of you who have children, I would pay very close attention to this data. Uh, right now, if you look in the, in the published literature, about 5% of football players and soccer players and hockey players are all diagnosed with concussions each year. That's in the medical databases. That's what the athletic trainers found. If you actually go back to the players and you ask them, well, how, like Dr. Cantu did to me, how many times were you hit and you experienced X, Y, and Z symptoms, the number's more like 50%. And this has been sliced and diced a million different ways now, and there's no one, no one should walk out of here not thinking this is true. A 2010 study uh, of, uh, of high schools with athletic trainers found those schools had lower injury rates because the trainers were taking good care of the athletes. But the one injury they had more of was concussions. They, uh, they had eight times as many in girls' soccer, four and a half times as many diagnosed in girls' basketball, just because there was someone there to actually recognize the injury and then take care of it. Mo the problem is most schools don't have athletic trainers, uh, and, be and that's at the high school level. Before the high school level, they don't really exist. There's no funding for them. So I promise you, if you had that sort of person there, you would be diagnosing five or ten times more concussions. A and then on top of that, if you add physicians to the, to the mix, a study found they took a league of 15 to 19-year-old ice hockey players who all had athletic trainers, and they split it in half. They said, this group do what you usually do. This group, we're going to put a physician in the stands, and her only job is to, when she sees someone sh showing concussion symptoms, pull them off the ice and evaluate them on the sideline. If they have a concussion, keep them out. This group had a 5% rate. This group had a 35% concussion rate in one season, seven times as many concussions with that physician. So you do the math on an, adding an athletic trainer, adding a physician, you're going to get 
20, 30, 50 times more concussions. And it doesn't matter, you know, I, wanted, I want to establish this point because it's so important. This is a survey of all athletes in Massachusetts, 2009. They asked them, they suffered a blow or jolt to the head while playing uh, that caused them to get knocked out, have memory problems, etc. 20% of all athletes. But when you look at the published data, this is, uh, states now are requiring uh, state uh, schools to report their concussions. In Missouri last year, had less than 1% of athletes actually diagnosed. 40% of high schools reported zero. So your kids are basically helpless out there with this injury uh, in the current state of the game. And part of the reason why is because uh, there's, uh, the athletes don't report their concussions. The reasons we always think they don't tell us when they're dinged or they have their bell rung, and we see this sort of pressure at the NFL level week after week, it's because they didn't want to leave the game or they didn't uh, want to let down their teammates. And that's something that we're going to have to overcome through education, but it's always going to be hard because we try to teach uh, take, you know, taking care of your teammates. But what's even more concerning is the top reason, the third reason, was they didn't think it was a serious enough injury. They didn't know they had a concussion. So that means that's an educational problem. We're not teaching them what they are. Uh, survey a 10-year-old hockey player, 64% thought they had needed to be knocked out to have concussions. Half of them could only name zero or one symptom of concussion. So again, your kids really know nothing. We're not doing much about it. There isn't actually even a validated educational program for your children to learn about concussions, other than one we have in about six cities, so not very many places. And then to add one more piece of data to that, the key is to get them off the field when they do have the injury. Well, uh, a new study just released uh, last month on three college programs with, with doctors, athletic trainers, uh, all the best, found that of 48 concussions that they had on these teams, only 17, or sorry, 17 couldn't be traced back to a hit, and only eight were diagnosed at the actual time of injury. So only one out of six are we diagnosing at the time. So you can see there is a dramatic need right now to actually diagnose concussions when they occur on the field or get them to the sidelines so they can get these concussions diagnosed that we aren't filling, making most sports very dangerous. I mean, even the NFL, uh, after Colt McCoy was put back in after being knocked unconscious on the field, where everybody saw it, but they claimed the doctors were busy treating other people, didn't see him unconscious, and so they put him right back in. They added an athletic trainer to the skybox just to watch the television feed, just to make sure that doesn't happen again. Your kids don't have that. And with one in four boys playing contact sports, with one in 16 girls playing contact sports, taking repetitive blows to the head on a voluntary basis, and getting concussions very frequently, we need to commit more to, to this issue. And so one of the ways that we're gonna solve this is through technology. And I'm very excited to see, uh, you know, to be at something like this and just see how much movement there has been in the last few years to be able to do this. Uh, you know, we can monitor all sorts of things, and we just heard all about that on the last few panels, about everything that we can, that we can monitor. And the other thing that we haven't really been thinking about, uh, but it is really applying technology to the concussion problem. And one way, um, and, that, and how we do that is to make these injuries visible as best we can, because the problem is you can't see a concussion. This is an injury you could see, this is an injury you would identify and you would take that athlete off the field and you wouldn't ask, the suck, ask them to suck it up. But what if we could see concussions? We're not quite to the Star Trek type of world where you can actually use any sort of device to actually diagnose the injury when it happens. We don't have that. Um, but what we, this, the best that we can come up with right now and something that'll make dramatic changes would be to combine an on-field indicator of severe brain trauma and potential concussive hits along with better sideline tests. Uh, so one of, the pro one of the products and what, you know, a group I've been consulting with, it's called MC MC10, has developed this device, which is uh, the, MC the Reebok check light. So this device actually has a blinking light on the back that if somebody is hit over a certain threshold, it goes yellow. If they're hit even over a more severe threshold, it goes red. When that, th that light goes yellow, you know that that athlete has potentially uh, taken a concussive hit. And the idea is you get them off the field and get them to the sideline to be assessed. Uh, there are a lot of uh, issues when you get to the sideline. Uh, you know, the, you know, the old days was you'd say, how many fingers am I holding up? The problem is just about everybody could answer that question right, or they didn't really care what the answer was. They would just put you back in. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, another place technology would be very important is getting to the, you know, when you have an athlete on the sideline, how do you measure 
that brain dysfunction, because most of the measurements from now are indirectly, do you have memory problems? Do you have a headache? Do you have symptoms? We don't actually know, do they have a concussion? Because that's something that we don't do a really good job defining. But this sort of concept, which is this is one of multiple products now in this new space that can actually have, uh, have an accelerometer, have a gyroscope here that actually can measure the impact. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited about getting these on the field so that we can really boost those diagnosed concussion numbers. Uh, you know, not every one is as obvious as this one. That kid stayed down, so luckily we know he probably has a concussion. But most hits are much more subtle than that. This is an example. I got an uh, email from a parent, uh, and he sent me these pictures because he was, he was so frustrated. Um, this is his son, and he was taking high-resolution shots from the sideline. Uh, the next slide uh, was the bad news. Took a helmet, a legal helmet to helmet hit from another kid that he didn't see coming. Uh, knocked him silly. Uh, however, uh, no one there really knew what to do. So they, no, and nobody watches your kid like you watch your kid. So he saw this happen through his camera lens. Coach didn't see it, no one else saw it. He's upset and he sent me this because after the game he realized he had a, he had a concussion. At the time, he did not. The time the athlete did not complain of symptoms. He probably he was 12. He probably didn't know any better. And so he played the rest of that game with a concussion. And I can guarantee you that hit would have, would have uh, triggered a sensor. And that would have uh, hopefully forced him to go to the sideline and have a, have a conversation or use the tests that are now coming onto the market, something like a King Divic, something like a SCAT 2, uh, to assess whether the concussion uh, occurred. So this sort of stuff is happening all the time, and, and these sorts of, this sort of technology uh, is really going to be a way to, to, fix, to fix this gap. Because the problems are we don't have the medical experts, and we're never going to have the medical experts. There is not the funding for it. There's not the will for it. Uh, we're not even training the children, and we're mostly not training the coaches as well to look for concussions. Children are too young to even understand the injury. You know, when Matt Hasselbeck's out there and he gets a concussion, he ha uh, he's not always going to recognize that concussion because he's had a brain injury. Uh, so, but, he's, but if he, has, if he is clear-headed enough, he could know, okay, I need to take time off, I need to rest a week or two so my brain can recover and I can have a long career. Children can't make that calculation. And then the real problem is the, the kids' brains are much more damaging, uh, the concussions are much more damaging to a youth brain. But another way this technology is now going to be used, beyond, uh, beyond just recognizing when there's potential concussions, is actually using this to, uh, as a way to uh, create prevention. And this is a concept that actually our Sports Legacy Institute has been uh, championing uh, based on pitch counts. For those of you who are baseball fans or have kids playing baseball, you know that we limit the exposure uh, that, that kids have throwing a ball through a pitch count. We learned over time that if a kid threw too much in a game or in a season, they risked wearing out their elbow ligament, their ulnar collateral ligament, and a handful of 11-year-olds were having to get Tommy John surgery, and that was a real tragedy because uh, they may not be able to play for the Cubs after that. So what they did was they limited every child. Every child, now if you're 10 and under, you can only throw 75 times, and if you're 11, it's 85, if you're 13, it's 95. This is not actually based on very much science if they all end in fives. We know this is just an assumption. This is probably a good idea. We should limit the elbow exposure. Uh, and this is actually easy to do. The technology you need is, well, you don't need a clicker, but most coaches use a clicker. You can usually use your memory, too, uh, or a pencil and paper. But that's the technology we need to, to tally these things. And then we, the coaches are actually required to write down the number and then send it into central office so all this stuff is tracked and calculated and kept to protect their elbows. We thought this is a much better idea for the brain. And that's where we came up with hit count because the technology is now there that we can measure this exposure. We know how many times they're hit in the head, we know how hard they're hit in the head, and we can start to set limits. Because again, if we have limits for elbows, we should have limits for brains. And in the unlimited world, we have some quite impressive exposures that we, uh, we have for athletes. If you are a college player, you're taking about 950 blows to the head per season that exceed 10 Gs of acceleration. High school players average a little less, but some of them get into, some of them have recorded nearly at 2,500 blows to the head in a season. The sad thing is, uh, about 70% of those are happening in practice. And these are just coaches 
that want to, uh, you know, can't think of a better thing to do than to ram the kids into each other. This actually happens. I don't know how many former football players are in the room, but this is called uh, a bull in the ring. This doesn't teach you anything about football. This just uh, teaches you to run into your teammates over and over again, usually helmet to helmet. So uh, this sort of stuff adds up over time. And, and we're learning adds up in even bigger ways than we realized because we recognize that concussive hits are damaging to the brain. We also know there's a certain threshold you can go up to where you aren't going to have a brain injury. We don't know what that is yet. But we're also finding hard hits that don't cause symptoms actually may be damaging to the brain, called subconcussive hits. This is a new area of research, but more and more we're finding when athletes get into the high hundreds of hits to the head in a season, they can actually see changes to their brain and their, their cognition is like they had a concussion. We don't really know what those long-term consequences are, but I can promise you they're probably not good consequences. And so we want to severely limit this thing. And, and, and so that's where we came up with hit count. And, and MC10 and a number of other companies jumped in and said, yes, you know, this is something, this is some way that we can actually make athletes dramatically safer. Because we are a group uh, of you know, advocates and scientists who think that the brain is more important than the elbow. And we look at a world where you are banned from teaching a child a curveball until they're 12 years old in baseball. And you would be thrown out of baseball if you, did, if you taught a 10-year-old a curveball. But you can hit a child in the head as soon as they can get up enough speed to run, and as much as you want. So the benefits of the hit count include limiting exposure, just limiting exposure, limiting risk of concussion, limiting risk of uh, long-term issues, but also providing real-time feedback. So the idea is that when you looked at high school team, the average kid took 600 hits, one kid or a few kids were taking over 2,000. What were they doing differently? Were they leading with their head? Were they playing too much? Were they being playing both ways? Uh, you can learn in week two that some kids on a trajectory to get into some crazy level of exposure and, and take steps to change that, to intervene in real time. Uh, you can allow parents to monitor rogue coaches. Do you know that in youth soccer, you're not supposed to teach headers until at least 10 years old, and I would probably recommend higher? It's not a well-known fact, and a lot of coaches like to teach them early. I, you know, I always, my favorite story is some kid who you know, emailed me in his mid-20s because he's having real issues, who said his, his, his youth coach used to like to put two kids in a circle and then kick the ball as high as he could in the air, and then whoever headed it first won. And that just meant that they constantly bashed their head in incredible ways. So a parent can actually know uh, when, uh, you know, when, a, when a child comes home or maybe eventually in real time on their iPhone, how many times their child's been hit when they pick them up. And they can talk to that coach and say, what are you doing out there? Uh, and then I think uh, by creating this data, and this will be a gigantic pool of data that we'll be able to do all sorts of fantastic things with, uh, we will be able to put you know, youth trauma uh, and uh, brain trauma in perspective and really inspire people to recognize that perhaps it's not such a great idea to expose children, especially the youngest ones, to extraordinary amounts of brain trauma. I think just by putting a number to the, to the problem for your child, people will suddenly go, well, you know what? Less is probably better. And I, it is an example. Um, I, I, as part of our initiative, we're actually going to have to set guidelines here. We're, we're meeting with medical experts uh, in this area to try to figure out, well, what, where should we set limits? What should we tell people to do with the hit count? And so I often crowdsource some of my data. So let me throw a for instance to you, and I want you to help me. Um, Let's just say that we, wanted, we told people that if you are a high school athlete, you should take no more than 1,000 blows that exceed 15 Gs in a season, whether, no matter what sport you're playing, soccer with headers, football, whatever. If you're, if you're 18 years old, or, or sorry, 15 years old, let's say it's 1,000. If it's 1,000 for 15-year-olds, where would you place six-year-olds? What advice would you give parents to say they shouldn't exceed that number? And so I want you to raise your hand when I hit the number that you like. And I have to, I'll, I'll, for scientific reasons, I have to start higher. Would anyone say that number should be 1,500? Should it be 1,000? Should it be the same as the high school players? Should it be 500? Should it be 250? Should the recommendation be 100 for six-year-olds? Get some hands. 50, 20, 10. How about zero? Okay, that's where most people are, and that's where most people end up, and it's, an, a fanta it's a fantastic exercise to start putting this stuff in context. We know that brain trauma uh, is going to happen. It, 
Luckily, most of the time, it's going to be accidental. But should we be creating sports, and should we be encouraging sports, and should we be not be policing sports where the brain trauma is encouraged and happens very frequently? So right now, the average is in the hundreds, and I think we'd want it to be dramatically less. These sorts of tools are really going to help us do that. And so uh, to wrap it up, uh, you know, the reality is concussions are an inevitable part of sports and an inevitable part of life. We know they're going to happen, but it's really about how we prevent them and how we handle them when they occur. And right now, we do a terrible, terrible job of recognizing concussions, and we do a terrible job of limiting exposure. And so technology is going to play an incredible role in eliminating unnecessary brain trauma through something like hit count and preventable brain damage through something like a check light system. So uh, I want to just, you know, I want to th thank the people who are developing these sorts of products because, uh, you know, thinking about a guy like Dave Dewerson, who's now, you know, one of over 100 athletes we have in the brain bank with families who tell extraordinary and terrible stories about what these athletes become when we don't control what happens to their brain. Uh, this will go a long way towards me being comfortable putting my future children out uh, on the sports field knowing that we can actually uh, police this brain trauma. So thank you very much for your time. Norinsky, I, I really like your ideas, but I really think that uh, I'm a retired medical administrator with the Air Force, uh, that there should be a, an ongoing effort to redesign some of these games, possibly. Uh, for instance, um, I know there's injuries in flag football, but I mean making it a wider field, longer field, and playing flag football, perhaps. Or going and encouraging high schools to maybe get into soccer. I know there's injuries in soccer, but I mean there may be less per time being played. And uh, really changing the culture of the acceptance of these programs. Thank you. Thank you. No, I think you're absolutely right. Well, the, the term we use is reform. We really, in this new knowledge of brain injury, we should be looking at every sport that we let children play and reforming them. And really, uh, what we like to think is separating them from the professional games. Professional games are there for entertainment. They're there to sell tickets, to turn TVs on. Uh, the kids' games should be about developing your child as a person. And that means uh, less, less brain trauma. So with the explosion of MMA and stuff, and kids starting to do MMA, have you guys started getting involved in uh, tracking any of that? You know, we, ha we, we aren't in the MMA uh, space par partially because there's luckily so few kids. Uh, you know, we're, uh, we're very uh, out, you know, out there in terms of you should not be having your kids do MMA. There should be no brain trauma. Uh, there should be no, I, I, I frankly, I'm against any youth boxing that involves brain trauma. Um, but you know, unfortunately, parents are making poor decisions uh, right now. Hi, I'm just wondering if you've encountered any kind of uh, like resistance to this, where people are, are really focused. They say they, they want to win. You know, I didn't worry about that when I was a kid, and and uh, you know, trying to say it's going to limit the ability of, of of people to go as far as they can, or, or maybe if you put in place regulations with it that it's taking away a choice from someone of saying, you know, well, I'm not going to worry about that. This is my current situation. This is what I want to do. Right. No, that's a great question. And, and I, I think, the, you know, the, the, the answer is, yes, we've met resistance, and that's why I'm up here having to talk about very obvious, logical things as if it's news. You know, that we shouldn't hit people in the head, that we should take care of concussions. Uh, watching, the, uh, watching head games would actually give you a great background into the fights that we had back uh, when the NFL said this wasn't real. And that we had congressional hearings were really the only thing that pushed them finally to say, you know what, we will take care of the players. I mean, uh, if you can convince Matt Hasselbeck to tell you about the, the good old days of the uh, NFL, you know, 10 years ago and how they treated concussions versus today, it's, it's quite shocking. Uh, Chris, thanks for your talk. Um, if you walk around this conference, there's all kinds of technology to measure your daily movements and how much calories you're burning, all kinds of accelerometers being built into iPhones and other devices. Can't some of that technology be put in the football helmet so it's more than just the Nike sensor? They could actually know real time what's happening for all the kids on the field? Right. Well, that, well that's, that's where this, this fits in. I mean, it, I, you know, I think the, bat, the, the check light 
and the, the companies that are in that space that are using sensors, putting them in helmets, headbands, mouthpieces, beanies, uh, ear, ear accelerometers. It's, it's a lot of the battle is becoming how many features do you add, like we said in the last one, for cost. You could do, you know, some of the things use sensors in a helmet that goes to a transmitting center, and then you have to have a, a medical person interpreting that, and that gets incredibly expensive, so people don't really use that. When it gets cheaper and simpler, uh, I think adoption will increase. And so, yeah, you know, I think I'm hoping that more and more groups come into the field, uh, and it's really going to be out about, you know, part of the issue is we have to create that awareness that this is a problem, that this solution is needed. And that's kind of the battle that we fight through SLI. Um, you might have answered my question there a little bit. Is is this technology like the the headband you have mm -hmm. there? Can that be worn outside of gear for like sports like soccer or right. um, boxing yeah. or anything where where that's going to light off even if you're not wearing a helmet or, or right? And it, um, so the beanie uh, is meant to be primarily under a helmet, partially because soccer players don't necessarily like beanies. So uh, it, it's all about getting the you know the real you know the, this part into other things. And so, yes, that's all happening. It's, it's, it's all about developing these into whatever that sport needs. So this will be used in everything. Uh, yeah, no question about it. Good, all right.